So I'd like to welcome everybody to the first research seminar of the fall 2020 research seminar series um, put on by the Department of Information Science and the Graduate School of Education. We are delighted today to have a speaker coming to us from Western Canada. And I'm going to introduce my colleague, Dr. Ying Sun, who is going to introduce our speaker. Ying. Thanks, Hattie. And it is my pleasure today to uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Ali Shiri. Uh, he is a professor in the School of Library and Information Science, uh, Information Studies at the University of Alberta, Canada. And he is currently an, also an uh, uh, associate dean in the Faculty of Graduate Studies and Research. Uh, Dr. Shiri's research and the teaching areas centered on digital libraries, uh, user interaction with digital information and the learning and data analytics. She is currently working on two uh, research projects. Uh, the one he he is going to share with us today is the one founded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And in this research project, he investigates the integration of digital storytelling in digital libraries. And another project is funded by the Institute of Museum and the Library Services. And in that, he is working on developing a digital content reuse assessment framework toolkit. It's called the DCraft. Welcome, uh, Dr. Ali Shri, and it's our pleasure to have you here. Thanks very much, Dr. San, for that introduction. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank my longtime colleague, Jenna, Dr. Heidi Julian, for this invitation for, and for the Department, you know, Department of Information Science at the University of Buffalo. Uh, it's an honor to be <laughs> to have this opportunity to speak with you about this project. So this project is um, a continuation of a, a previous project that uh, we conducted and developed a digital library for uh, the Inibiala Settlement region. And it's an area in the Western Arctic, Canada's Western Arctic, which I will talk about the uh, geographic context so we get a better sense of where it is actually I'm talking about. But this specific project that started in 2019 and it's for three years now with COVID-19 obviously is gonna be probably extended another year is about how we can actually create a, a real time digital storytelling system that could be integrated uh, into the digital library that we have created before to provide a platform, seamless platform for accessing uh, the library, but also real time recording stories of community members, elders, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, people in, in those six communities that I'll be talking about. So it, it really is, as I said, um, it focuses on cultural heritage preservation and access for Inuit communities in the North. And if you if you know like obviously Alaska uh, from the U.S. side and then uh, extending towards uh, more kind of Western Canada and then Eastern Arctic in the Calwood. So really, when we are talking about the North, is is very uh, is very wide and vast. So this project is which we started last year. It's really a collaborative project, and by that, what I uh, I really mean is working with community members uh, and community leaders uh, in the uh, Inuvialuit Cultural Resource Center. This picture on the left-hand side that you will see, it is located in Inuvik. And I'll talk about Inuvik, uh, where it is actually on the map. And the top right-hand side, you will see our three, um, basically, um, uh, community partners, um, Ethel Jean uh, Gruben, uh, Lena, Kutukak and uh, Beverly Amos, and the other two are uh, PhD students who have been working on this project, Robin Stubbs and Sharon Farnell. And the picture at the bottom you will see is one of the one of the workshops that we held that focusing on how we can capture um, stories in a kind of uh, uh, real time and, and digitally. So uh, geographic context. So the Inuvialuit settlement region, as you will see uh, highlighted uh, uh, here, is a, a community of basically a group of six communities in the uh, Northwest Territories. 
And uh, these six communities actually were recognized by the federal government in Ottawa in 1984. And they have a regional corporation that manages resources, people, beneficiaries, et cetera. So if I give you a kind of a more uh, zoom in setting for this one, you will see that the Inuvialuit um, Settlement region consists of these communities. Uh, Inuvik is the center, basically the town center, which the largest population about 3,300. And that is the focal point for our project. And other communities are Eklavik, as you will see here, Tuktoyaktuk, Saks Harbor, uh, Ulukoktok, and Politok. And in terms of uh, population, you'll get a sense of, uh, it's not like a very densely populated area. It's about roughly 6,000. And you will see this is the Arctic Ocean. So Inuvik actually is located roughly 130 miles north of the Arctic Circle. So you get the idea where it is. It is, it is basically North Pole, right? And it's, uh, so the, the temperatures in those areas can vary from um, say from 50 um, Fahrenheit in the summer to minus 30 Fahrenheit in the winter. So we get the scale of how cold it can be. And in terms of population, so it's north, and then this uh, on this map, I want to just draw your attention to how far away Buffalo is from Inuvik uh, in terms of the uh, sort of uh, mileage, but also how long it takes to actually fly from Buffalo to Inuvik. So even uh, when you look at uh, Alberta, we are located in Edmonton. Um, if I just show you from Edmonton to Inuvik is about uh, roughly three hours flight. So you could go from Edmonton to Toronto for roughly three hours. So you get this scale. And it is important to actually uh, provide this geographic sort of uh, context and information because distance is one of the key challenges. Some of those communities that I mentioned, they are only accessible by flying in and out. You cannot drive or you cannot even boat in the summer. Some of them are available, but not all of them. So the project, digital storytelling project, really what we proposed was to investigate, develop, and evaluate a real-time uh, audio recording digital storytelling and commenting user interface that could be part of the Inuvial Digital Library. The Inuvial Digital Library itself is now, was, which is the outcome of our previous project, is now a publicly accessible a digital library that it has more than 5,000 digital objects, which if I can show you briefly, uh, it is important again for contextual uh, kind of uh, reasons uh, to give you a if you bear with me. Um, So this is the um, Inuvialu, it's a digital library that we created over the course of four years from 2014 to 2018. The reason I'm bringing this up is because the digital storytelling system we are developing is gonna be an integral part of this digital library. So anything like all these stories that are gonna be captured are gonna be seamlessly incorporated into the library for metadata, for description, for other purposes. And this is important for empowering Northern communities in, in terms of, uh, as I said, cultural heritage. So this digital library, as you will see, uh, has a huge range of resources. Uh, if you take a look, you will see language resources, uh, video, audio, image, text. And um, for example, those communities uh, speak three, speak the language of the Inuvialuktun which is uh, the formal uh, language uh, in addition to three dialects. So these dialects are different. So the communities that I show that, that, that are far apart, they actually speak different, different dialects. Uh, Salirmison, for example, is one example. And you could, you know, you could actually um, learn the language in terms of uh, you know, how uh, you can speak or say greetings in a particular language. If I can just show you one example, this is the work that was done in the previous project, but it does um, you know, uh, serve as a basis for what we are hoping to do. So this is 
for example, language lesson in English and in Indian Realoctan, and you could actually play it and learn it, plus proper metadata added to each individual object. And that was another way of organizing content, but also culturally appropriate metadata. For example, places that you will see here, they are, there are local names, for example, Canada, as you will see here, it's also uh, pronounced uh, or uh, Kanata uh, by uh, Inuit communities in the North. So providing those uh, alternative access points in metadata uh, was another way of looking at how we can make this digital library culturally uh, appropriate uh, kind of repository of uh, digital content. Obviously there are uh, other aspects of it, but what is important is this is now a publicly accessible digital library. And uh, I would like to focus more on the, uh, the storytelling side that uh, I uh, just mentioned. Um, so, so we wanted to create this uh, system that would be a, a part of this digital library for um, accessing materials, but also recording stories, because we know that um, there are all kinds of devices people could use, you know, from small screen devices to various tools that they could use. But the challenge of actually uploading into a digital library, adding metadata, describing those and making it uh, kind of linguistically relevant for them, uh, it, it is a challenge. And that's where we focused uh, our attention. Um, and so the specific objectives uh, of the project, uh, first of all, we wanted to, because those communities are far north and understanding those communities, we have been working with them for the past seven years, uh, establishing a novel community-driven participatory design methodology. And this is really, um, um, important because it's not like us showing up in that community and saying that we want to create a digital storytelling for you. So it's it's really it's a community focused uh, uh, approach. So um, there is a history and literature about participatory design, and I'm sure you know some of you have worked on it. For example, I know Val with children and the, the work of previous work in, at McGill have focused on how we can do bonded design with children. This is a different one focusing on communities in the North, but understanding those communities and needs. And then design, prototype, and develop an interface that has any Vialuktan language features for storytelling, not just English. And then through that process, when they actually tell stories and record stories, they could we could actually enhance the current content of the digital library that I just uh, showed you. And conducting finally a usability uh, evaluation of that uh, digital storytelling system. So some key considerations in terms of methodological kind of practices when it comes to indigenous communities uh, in general. I mean, uh, obviously there is research in Australia, uh, US um, and uh, in New Zealand about this, but historically indigenous communities have not really benefited properly from researchers and work and scholarly because they have not been either incorporated into research process or even you know uh, recognized for their uh, for their indigenous knowledge or knowledge systems so uh, and this is reported in many um, published uh, articles and and uh, peer-reviewed uh, publications before and the idea of decolonizing methodologies in other words paying attention what what uh, knowledge practices or knowledge acquisition and dissemination practices indigenous communities have, how you can actually benefit from those as part of your research process. Not, as I said, not just showing up, say, this is what we want to do. We are going to use standard interview, qualitative or quantitative methods, or uh, kind of uh, conduct a formal survey. It doesn't work that way so it's very different and it's it's imperative to actually recognize community members and leaders and elders when you want to do this a lot of it is depends on on gaining trust uh, in those communities i told you I, i've been working with those communities or we have been for the past seven years and building that trust uh, has been uh, foundational and very important to actually be able to conduct these uh, this kind of study 
Another element of this work is community informatics. Um, one of the uh, people we, uh, that we have been really influenced by is uh, Serena Vassin, a, a professor in the University of uh, California, UCLA, uh, um, who has done extensive work in South America, focusing on indigenous, uh, uh, basically, uh, research and acknowledging cultural practices. And uh, for some of you, I, I probably Heidi would remember uh, back in 2018, he may, he actually was the keynote speaker at the ACES conference, uh, which was a fascinating um, talk. So he has done extensive work in that area. So we use that model, but that's for South America. So we benefited from some of those uh, um, methodological basically nuances to learn more about how we can actually gain a social perspective when it comes to designing systems for uh, indigenous communities. Um, I would like to emphasize uh, the importance of community engagement this, in this whole process. It's really very important. Uh, as you'll see, these are different pictures uh, showing us how we actually engage with various uh, individuals, participated in ceremonies, cultural festivals, ways of love, myth-making, bannock-making, being basically there uh, and, and learning from, uh, from those communities. Uh, you will see that uh, th these pictures show some of those. More specifically, learning about community organizations in the North, right? Uh, and this picture, you will see Canada Post. You may wonder, so what do we have to do you know, with Canada Post? But in those small places, community places, all community organizations matter to your research, should matter to your research, because otherwise you can't actually get your research done. You know, that's how it works in those uh, kind of remote rural, uh, norm, sorry, northern communities. So in UL Corporation, Aurora College, Aurora Research Institute, and uh, as you will see those examples of places where we try to engage community members, plus uh, Midnight Sun Complex, uh, a great um, recreation center where we actually set a table and we just talk to people. We sat there, watched um, a hockey game and cheered on the local team, home team. And it was just, you know, as I said, it's, it's, it's important to have that kind of uh, interaction with community members and elders. And um, more uh, you will see in this picture again, um, how uh, be involved in, uh, in various activities, talk to various communities, and note that some of those communities, as I showed, like Saks Harbor or, or uh, Ulukoktok, you have to fly. So, uh, and it's expensive uh, in the north. So, we are really, uh, we acknowledge and appreciate the SHIRC or uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada's support for this kind of research because it is expensive. So flying uh, using bush planes, you know, as you will see in this picture, in those communities, six or eight seaters usually, um, to get to those places. So these are some pictures from, uh, some of them new, some of them are from the previous, but uh, speaking of community engagement, it's important to talk to people. You're not there just to get your research, own research done. And that's, that's important. So for the digital storytelling system, community-based uh, methodology uh, was the foundation. So the three facets you will see participatory research, participatory design and ethnography, which I, uh, I go through and you will see, this is a picture of the uh, digital uh, storytelling uh, workshop that we held back in November, which I'll be talking about more extensively in terms of, uh, particularly in relation to this project. You know, ethnography has widely been reported and recently more widely used in information science as a qualitative method to actually understand whether it's information seeking behavior, information search process, or how different communities, marginalized communities make use of information has widely been used. In this picture, you will see um, elders actually telling stories uh, in, in that workshop. And they are telling stories based on the actual stories, images, and language resources available in the digital library that you are shown. So in a way, it shows how, how you can actually int interconnect these different experiences. And the picture you will see at the uh, bottom left-hand side is me uh, uh, in one of those trips that actually a tour of, uh, a dog sledding tour of 45 minutes that you had to actually maintain your balance. And this wasn't, a, this wasn't done for fun. It really was 
developing that appreciative stance that Serena Vassin was talking about. How today these dog teams are used as a means of transportation, and it's very common. And it's it's a challenge uh, to you know maintain on, and your balance on that on that sled, and it's just learning about different activities and ways of doing things that uh, would be part of this research. It's not as I said, it's not just creating a proposal and and hiring research assistants and getting that research. You need to be you really need to be there. And you will see here um, uh, Bev Amos, one of our community partner, partners, who is a language instructor and knows all the three dialects, is talking about uh, how uh, the, the pronunciation of their names, their Inuvialuit and Inuit names have been, have been, have changed and their names have changed when, you know, the RCMP officers in Canada, they showed up back in the 50s and 60s that they gave them basically a sort of anglicized version of their names, uh, which I'm sure you've heard about, you know, in Alaska and other places where they wanted to actually try to um, remove the culture or in other words, to actually um, um, make um, the language, basically trivialize the language and, and so that they forget after generations that people, people would speak English and would have names like Mark and Matthew and, and Jack and other names that some of them in fact do. And they, they, they talked about that and they told stories about those, which was very interesting. So participatory design, what, what does that mean? It's when it comes to community informatics and designing systems and technologies, it's, it is very important and it is important to understand community needs, but also equally important to involve community members in the process. And you, that's how you enable those uh, communities in terms of being able to use digital technologies. So the pictures you will see uh, top left, actually they are using a digital the digital library for telling stories, but also for identifying family members, et cetera and then telling stories about those, uh, those individuals. Um, and it's about co-interpretation and co-development of the digital library, making sure that community members understand the purpose of this project and contribute to it actively. So the workshop that we held, I'll tell you uh, that how uh, they were in charge, not us as researchers, we were more just um, observers acting as observers uh, rather than actually leading the project. Uh, so you will see that uh, I kept using the term digital storytelling as a process of using various media and, and technologies to create and share stories. Uh, this area actually became more popular by a Center for Digital Storytelling, I think it's in, in California in the 1990s that they wanted to capture stories of various multicultural communities and ethnic groups for cultural heritage preservation and access. And the idea came then, but since the 1990s, things have changed. There are a lot of a wider range of technologies you could use. And, but the, but the gist of it is it started around that time. And um, obviously it's a powerful way of uh, cultural uh, heritage preservation and access. Um, more specifically, when it comes to digital storytelling at, as it relates to indigenous communities, indigenous communities look at storytelling not just as conveying information or communicating information, which actually seems to be uh, one of the very popular nowadays marketing uh, uh, and uh, business strategies. A lot of large corporations these days actually use storytelling as a way of uh, making more profit. So, Storytelling is powerful, but for indigenous communities, also about uh, supporting, sharing, and preservation of knowledge and information. And that means whatever they are, for example, if it is bannock making or myth making or drum making or various games, it's also about sharing that, but also preserving, you know, the generation after. So this is uh, uh, Fred uh, Wolke, he is actually, he stood up and talked about his dad, which is in the picture, talking about how he was, he was involved when they, when they were actually 
when he was very young and they were uh, on a sort of a hunting trip uh, to, to a clavic. And he's talking about how those years difficult it was for them to actually commute, uh, which was part of, so those stories are not, there is a story I start from here and end there. It is quite multifaceted and there are emotional elements, cognitive elements, the understanding of the environment, the notion and importance of place. They are all play in this whole process. And this is um, Annie in Politoff. And we always give credit to this woman and elder because when she stood up for the first time, she stood up back in 2017 as part of our demonstration of the digital library start, started telling this story. The idea of actually this project basically was, uh, was formed because we had no idea that this, some, something like this would be possible for this particular community. So uh, really um, interaction with uh, digital technologies like this example that you will see is, is very uh, interesting and is thought provoking and opens up new areas for, for further research. And uh, so to the workshop on um, basically an um, elders workshop. We held a, a workshop in uh, November, 2019 from 12 to 15 of November, 2019. And what we wanted to do is in this project, rather than just jumping and developing prototype or a system, we thought we need to learn about the process of storytelling in the Inuyal Selim region. So we invited, and this is with the close collaboration of community members that you will see Bev here and Lena, we are foundational and instrumental in actually making this workshop happen and possible. Um, so we invited two elders from very, each of those six communities, Aklavik, uh, Nelly, Ari, and Reni, Tukti, Aktik, Agnes, Fred, and Sandy, Inovic, Sammy, Politok, George, and Elizabeth Kuptana, and Annie Thrasher, Sachs Harbor, Margaret Car Carpenter, and Ulla Kopsak, Mary, and Connie. So these were elders from various communities. We wanted to make sure all those six communities are represented because they do speak different dialects. The language is the same, but even, even in terms of climate and weather, there are very significant kind of weather pattern differences in those communities that when they speak, you learn how nuanced that is in terms of storytelling. And uh, this is the setting for, um, for the digital storytelling, uh, elder storytelling uh, workshop that we held and uh, very, very comfortable environment. And we hired a, a professional uh, photographer and vi uh, videographer to actually capture all those stories. And those stories are currently in the Inibial Digital Library, by the way. But we didn't do this, we didn't call this just digital storytelling. We call this storytelling as a, as a process to learn about how indigenous communities tell stories, interjections when they actually collaboratively tell stories, what are the nuances or cultural nuances of, of telling stories uh, when, when they start actually. And someone else remind them something about the name of an, an individual or a place. It's all part of that storytelling process and we wanted to learn from it. From their uh, their experience, and by the way, you know, as you know, these these are uh, these elders. A lot of them are probably over seventy five or around eighty years or eighty five years old. So this is also the the those communities really appreciated that we are actually capturing their stories and making them, you know, uh, live long in this digital library that would be publicly accessible for researchers, for the general public, for community members, for language learning. Um, purposes and you will see there are, uh, there are uh, each of them took you know turn introduce themselves talk about their experiences and the beginning and ending of this story is not like the sort of kind of cliche kind of standard or kind of I guess um, academic way of telling stories it just we didn't know that and we had to learn obviously but uh, we are still learning uh, is how you interject, how do you, do you probe at all or do not probe when they are telling the story or you don't know a, a term, do you ask them? All those uh, uh, specific aspects of storytelling are, are important for creating a system that is actually culturally relevant and relatable. 
So this is Annie and, uh, and Rennie. They are actually uh, looking at uh, stories from the actual digital library um, and um, telling each other and sharing a story about their, uh, her mother and, and Rennie is, is talking about. And, and you will see this picture is small. I'm showing on the screen of a laptop that is projected on the big screen. And so really trying to integrating storytelling and using digital technologies to learn how a, to design a digital storytelling system. And you'll see here, Mary and, and um, Connie are um, actually uh, singing a hymn uh, during the uh, workshop. And that's part of the storytelling as well, that they feel that at that point they are talking about. And um, very comfortable environment sitting and even in this casual informal kind of interactions, there are stories. And that's what we learn as, as, as researchers. How do you gather data? You don't just show up with a script of interview or a set of questions on a survey. You just, you integrate yourself naturally and organically as part of the uh, storytelling process. And, and, and you let it, uh, the conversations and casual conversations actually uh, lead you and your interaction with communities. So this picture actually captures all the 12 uh, elders um, and uh, myself and the, the, the um, doctoral researchers, uh, research students uh, uh, that are working on this project. And what is interesting about this, you will see this, uh, the, um, the man in the middle just, uh, between these two is Dwayne um, Smith, uh, who is the chair of the NUBL Regional Corporation. And so a leader in that community who was very kind of supportive of the project, made things happen. And just uh, happy that um, this project is actually somehow helping uh, to preserve the language resources, et cetera. And sadly, one of these, uh, you know, Elizabeth or Liz, actually uh, passed away in the spring. So uh, which, speaks to, which speaks to the importance of uh, how and in what ways can we actually accommodate and, and, and empower uh, those communities to tell their stories and uh, capture them and make them accessible, you know, uh, and uh, for the next generation. And also again, in, in general for cultural heritage preservation. So as a result of that, we had a um, visit from our community partners, uh, Ethel Jean, uh, Lena, and Bev uh, in Edmonton, December, a month after that. So this all happened before COVID-19, right? We are really glad that we managed to actually do the first part. So we hosted the, them. We wanted to actually, with their help, develop a prototype as interface for telling the stories. So they actually had visit to the Provincial Archives of Alberta and other places. And uh, we wanted to actually uh, get feedback from them just to see how they uh, view this new prototype. It still is a very kind of rudimentary uh, interface that uh, this is the prototype we have uh, help, uh, you know, developed with the, their help, which is gonna be, uh, obviously this is not gonna be the final product, but this is gonna be if, uh, uh, system part of the digital library that people would seamlessly record their stories, whatever device they have, whether it's iPhone, iPad, laptop, the tablets, different, different, different um, devices that, um, so the prototype is just to provide basic metadata like your name and what is your story about. Uh, and they, you know, whether they want to uh, say in English or in Yubialekta, which is their language, and then record their story and uh, just the you know, basic features. So what we found that uh, obviously uh, listening to um, the three community partners, they wanted more uh, um, easier access to these features because they felt how do we rewind or, or play or the difference between that and what if we want to actually download this story? right, before we get it or before we submit it. So a kind of a more kind of refined version, and this is still the prototype at that time. Um, we added two separate sort of control mechanisms. The first one focusing on uh, recording this story, stopping and playing, and you could actually download in a very light 
lightweight version of the file and story um, that you could actually download on your desktop or your device and um, listen. And you could actually review it and add a photo uh, and uh, upload it onto the digital library. So that would be very seamless. So, so someone would moderate the kind of addition to the digital library plus adding metadata to, to this whole process. So you may wonder, so what would be, you know, what would be the advantage of this is, as, as we said, how can we integrate digital storytelling into digital library work and making it a seamless process for capturing stories and sharing stories publicly. And so that, that really is, uh, was the intention. So this is basic. So we wanted to actually, in the summer, in July, we were, well, we had planned to go to up north to Inovec and those communities to get feedback and actually work with some uh, elders to see how, what parts of this interface should change, which unfortunately, because of COVID-19 um, and, and travel uh, restrictions, we couldn't do it. And so things got a bit slowed, uh, but uh, we were hoping to have open house move, movement, uh, sort of, e sorry, events uh, there and setting information tables in the, you know, different places in the supermarket and the, you know, sports center, etc. So this is still is the plan, but this is going to be next year. And the idea of co-designing and iterative uh, redesign of the digital storytelling interface still is, is key because we know that this is just a basic plan yet, but we are now currently thinking about how we can actually involve one or two community members in the North and virtually conduct a usability evaluation of the interface simply because the interface that I showed you is web-based. Is web -based. Is, uh, is web-based so you can actually, any device you have on the internet, you would be able to record stories. So we don't have to be there for that. And, uh, but we wanted to uh, sort of de develop a protocol for usability. So folks in the North could actually connect using Zoom or Google Meet and do usability and basically co-design this in an iterative way as much as possible. So, so we are at this stage that currently. So as I said, this is kind of a, four-year project where we are at uh, at this stage develop um, the uh, prototype and we are focusing on actually adding more cultural elements in the meantime we are looking at indigenous digital storytelling systems that have been developed around the world there are some in the u.s uh, and there are some in uh, New Zealand and Australia and some in Canada. We are looking at the in interface features for, the, uh, for those projects to see what we can actually uh, adopt or in how we can inform our design in terms of cultural practices and even uh, color combination, web usability aspects, uh, user interaction and user experience. So really hand in hand, working with communities, to develop the interface, but also uh, informed by the literature and uh, previous practices and design models that have been uh, uh, done around the world. So that's that's really the ideas that we are currently focusing on. And I would like to just uh, acknowledge these folks. So Elizabeth uh, Cole, uh, Inuvial Regional Corporation photographer, and um, um, research team, my research team, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Uh, and, um, and also the Inuvialut Cultural Resource Center, which is the focal point, and Inuvialut Regional Corporation, which I said is a community corporation that manages resources and uh, beneficiaries and basically in charge of decision making for, uh, for the community. Thank you. So I'll stop um, sharing and uh, I hope I am on time, Heidi. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Very well done. We've got lots of time for questions. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shiri. That was yeah. uh, fascinating. Lots of threads that um, one could follow there. Um, so far, we only have one comment um, in the chat. Um, and so I would encourage people to either post questions there or, or raise your hand. So I'll just start with um, Val's question here. Are you aware of the work done by Steve Jordan at McGill University? Mm, that's a very interesting question. No, I'm not. Um, so that's 
Yeah, he um, he's one of the originators of participatory action research, right? Which is okay. exactly uh, very close to participatory design and and pretty much exactly what you're doing. And he worked and has been working. I just looked up on his website um, with indigenous peoples in uh, Quebec's north. And he oh, has okay. really interesting um, research that I think would, um, and some ideas and things that I think would uh, inform your research. And he's in, fac in the Faculty of Education. He's in the Faculty of Education. Oh, interesting, yes. okay. Yeah, <laughs> we are is. in the Faculty of Education too. Perfect, yeah. thank you. Steve Jordan. Yeah, yeah. and he's actually, I think um, he's actually a uh, department, he's the department chair of the uh, Department of Integrated Studies. Perfect. Yeah. No, yeah, thank you. Anyway, I just thought I would. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, for sure. That's I, very I, useful. I, um, I, I've done a lot, of, like, he's done a lot of really interesting work. So I just thought I'd let you know. <laughs> it's interesting. No, and it's, it's, it's funny because um, folks in the Western Arctic also sometimes say that, you know, the Eastern Arctic and the Western Arctic, even the Wolf are north, but the distance is sometimes they feel that the Western Arctic feels that. Otherwise, not paying close attention to the Western Arctic the way they do to the Eastern. And the same you could say, argue about research, how sometimes in one country, you know, you may not be aware, but I appreciate this uh, suggestion. I'll definitely look him up to see what he has done. Thank you for that. Uh, Dan, you had a question. Sure. Thank you, uh, Heidi. And thanks so much for the presentation. That was fantastic. And we appreciate you being here and, and sharing your your knowledge and wisdom with us and um you know telling us about this study specifically so we appreciate that i, I just to ask a, a quick question for context um we we also hear the term a lot um in our profession of oral histories and video oral history and um wondering how you see the difference between that and the storytelling that you're collecting and i, I have another little question to follow up after but i'll I'll let you respond to that. Great, great question, Dan, great question. And, and that's a very interesting question because the digital, the Inuviala Digital Library does actually have oral history content. Now, I, you know that I am not an oral historian. I am a more kind of information science person, but the, which means I am not really familiar with the way that oral history works extensively. But I do know that storytelling techniques have been used to do that kind of capturing and preservation. So there are, there are some kind of basically intersecting, I, I would say, components and elements that are, are doing. In fact, a lot of uh, projects that we have reviewed, they have kind of interchangeably, sometimes kind of synonymously used oral history and and digital storytelling. But in, in reality, it's because it's indigenous communities, I'm being very honest with you, I took this approach that I need to learn, right? I'm not making any assumptions in advance that I know what I'm doing, even though we proposed this, even though we had some knowledge and literature and all of that, but, uh, but it's an absolutely important point that you're making that there are some connections, but I, I believe Sometimes the, me uh, the methods are different. So for example, in oral history, you get some really professional interviewers uh, with extensive knowledge of how to actually glean data and probe various aspects, uh, historical aspects of a story. Whereas in this project, the focus is how can we facilitate and use technologies to enable community uh, members and elders to tell stories and capture them themselves. So it's a kind of a kind of a different kind of context. But I appreciate your point. It's it's a very kind of fine and solid point that you're making. Great, thank you. My other question is about the actual the, the features um, and interface uh, future interfaces for the digital library. So when I see this. Um, when I saw this pres presentation, I, I think back of a project that I used to follow um, at Carnegie Mellon, and they once tested with the data set. It's called the Infermedia Video Digital Library Project, right, right, right. and they they tested one time with um, video oral histories. And what was interesting from that is that their features um, that that they developed 
really came from more of a perspective of kind of like a, you know, digital curation type of perspective, like almost like museum curation type, but on in an online in a uh, format in a video digital library. Um, for example, their their browse features were not necessarily just the standard browse, but they were able to like visualize the data set of, of again, video oral histories, like by if a year was mentioned in the transcript right. or a location, they could map those out geographically or on some type of timeline and it would allow people to, to browse that video oral history collection based on like when people were talking about a certain place and time, right? So I was wondering if maybe you um, are planning for such type of, you know, that type of browse or interaction with right. the collection and data set as a whole, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you're, I'm very glad that actually you raised that down. I know that you have worked on video retrieval and, and you know, as part of your PhD research back then, but also what is interesting is currently uh, the platform we are using is called Omeka. Some of you may have heard. It's a kind of an open source application developed in the US and award winning. And we are using because a, a lot of digital exhibits and virtual museums are using it. It's very powerful, but there are limitations. And in fact, what you're referring to is how Informedia use metadata elements to provide browsing and navigation functionalities to make it more interactive, right? Which Omeka does not support. We are actually um, exploring how to uh, basically uh, migrate this uh, onto a more powerful repository system that would allow us to actually use all metadata elements. For example, we have a dialect metadata element, which can nicely uh, uh, sort of filter content based on dialect and based on geographic location, wherever you know those uh, content areas are. So at the moment, <clears throat> excuse me, Omeka is not able to do that kind of browsing, but it is an important element. You're right. You could actually, you could actually say in this digital library or in this stories, I want stories in the between 1985 and 1988. How to capture it? And you know, uh, so that, <clears throat> excuse me, that affordance does not exist in in Omeka, but we are hoping with the migration to this new system that actually was developed by the Art Resource Center and the University of Alberta. It's a more kind of a comprehensive content management repository management that has flexible modern interface that would allow all kinds of browsing and navigation functionalities, for example, names of individuals or names of places that are important for retrieval and chronology and dates, as you said. So, it's 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 a well made point. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. We have another question posted in chat, but I think we had a hand up earlier. Um, Laconda Fields, did you have a question for the speaker? Oh, there's a question, Heidi, about uh, Yeah, I just thought I saw a hand earlier. Yeah. Oh, okay. Was, was that the case, Laquanda? No, that wasn't me. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. My mistake. Okay, no so we, we have a, uh, a question by Sam Abramovich. Thank you so much for your presentation. I wanted to ask about your research and generalizability. We have a colleague here at UB who will argue that using decolonization and indigenous research methods are incompatible with traditional research articles that have theoretical frameworks and conclusions that can then be applied to other contexts or settings. Do you imagine the same for the work you presented or do you think it can be applied to other contexts? If the latter, can you suggest one or two? That's a great question. <laughs> and that is one that has come up a lot and comes up actually, it crops up quite often because you're, you're absolutely right. And I, you heard me saying throughout this presentation that you may not be able to do standard survey or interview and, and or methodological considerations that we normally do in kind of solid information science research. Uh, but the challenge is even identifying, um, well, I would, I would start by saying that um, when we talk about, for example, indigenous communities, some folks who are not very familiar, they feel that indigenous communities are a group of people that have very similar uh, kind of uh, characteristics are very similar in terms of cultural practices and beliefs, which is not, which is not accurate, right? We are talking about First Nations, Métis, Inuit, 
And even within Inuit, what is fascinating when you look at the, for example, Canada as an example, the Eastern Arctic that I just mentioned and the Western Arctic in Alaska, some of these folks actually came from Alaska. They said when there was a caribou crash and there was no caribou for hunting, we actually moved from Alaska to, uh, to Inuvik. So for them, territories and boundaries don't really matter. This is us geographically and politically, we are creating these jurisdictions. So um, I don't wanna digress from that, but I just wanted to mention there are very kind of subtle differences and cultural differences, even within Inuit communities across Canada. So when you talk about generalizability, some elements are definitely could be generalizable. For example, um, um, storytelling or using storytelling for cultural heritage preservation in, in general, but more specifically, informal ways of interacting with people, casual conversations, informal conversations in cafes and you know, uh, the drop-in centers and those places, those are powerful methods. I know that they are not like, as I said, rigidly sometimes structured um, methodological kind of uh, approaches that we take in uh, our studies. To some extent, there is always this trade-off between those traditional ways of knowing and knowledge systems and the uh, met methods and frameworks that we tend to use more on, on based on a kind of a Western way of doing studies and scientific research or academic research. So I think there is a kind of, there is a, um, there has to be a balance between these. So what we learned that we, we try to publish and present, some of it may be, you know, may be used. But I, for example, I can't argue that these, uh, these methods work, would work for uh, studying um, this phenomenon in Mascochis, which is an hour south of Edmonton, which is a Métis uh, settlement. These are very different contexts, even though you could argue the umbrella term indigenous methodologies or decolonization would work for, for both. So I guess I'm just uh, agreeing with you that some of the methods or approaches may not be fully generalizable uh, for, for all indigenous communities, but some would. Uh, and, and that's how we try to learn actually what works, what doesn't work. I hope that addresses your question, Sam. Uh, I, I don't want to take away a chance for anyone else to talk. I, I have a quick follow-up, though, if, if there's Go time ahead. for it. Go ahead. Um, uh, you, thank you. Yeah, it, it does answer uh, my question, but but then I, I'm, uh, uh, as someone, uh, I would describe myself as someone who wants to embrace this kind of perspective, but I still struggle uh, with doing it because, for example, and it's, it's very interesting work you presented, but so then how do you then figure out what is generalizable, what isn't? Like, wh wh where is the... Um, so some, right, so obviously, you know, you, you very clearly explained the differences and what, why certain things, can, you know, like you can't make assumptions, certainly, right, like a, one indigenous, you know, group is, you know, this is very different than another and exactly, right, the methodology you, you, you suggested won't necessarily apply into the next. So then how do we then uh, uh, figure out what part of that then can be generalizable or what, and, and, you, and I'm not suggesting you have to come up with the, the solution, right, but then right. what do we then do as a field even to kind of, right. you know, explore and, and, and uh, uh, do that only because I think there's something to be gained from that also, right? Not, not at the uh, loss of this kind of work that you're doing, right? right. <clears throat> not to deprioritize the work, but it, it's a yes and. If I'm yeah, you are trying making, to explain it all. Yeah. You're asking a fundamental question, Sam, and it's it's absolutely valid. You're right. The things that could be generalizable, for example, you take take uh, co-design or participatory design as a as a method. It has been used by Microsoft, Google, several companies and organizations, right, in different contexts. This could be used in an indigenous community or any other community. Some of the elements would be transferable, right? Honestly, it is possible because what we are learning, it would work in other contexts. And that's what we are trying to document and disseminate. So hopefully, you know, folks like yourself, other people are interested would be able to, uh, to benefit from. 
But I found that um, even those uh, uh, frameworks like Spinozzi that focused on uh, participatory design, some of that you need to be flexible in terms of bending some of those principles. Some of them happen to be very rigidly presented or the target audience or community or people involved tended to be academics or educated users or people live in large urban uh, metropolitan areas as opposed to thinking about the context of this north. That's why I showed those maps. What would work in that context? If what, what for example, what if we found that holding open house events is a powerful way of community in, involving community members. From nine to five, just yeah, serve bannock and, and the soup and people stop by for an hour or two and tell you what they think about your digital library and, and the objects, right? I'm sure those would work in most communities, right? There are some elements and methods that would work, but there are some that would require, uh, of course, um, modifications or, or changes. But I agree with you. We can't just kind of in a vacuum say, how do you decolonize methodologies, right? You have to be, you know, you have to pin it down and say, what would you suggest as recommended practices that would work at least for say Inuit communities in Alaska, if, if you were to study, right? So there are some elements that would definitely be generalizable. Thank you, that, 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 that's uh, very helpful, thank you. Well, we've uh, come to the end of our hour and the end of our questions. And um, I would just like to echo Dan's earlier comments, Ali, and just thank you um, very sincerely from, from us who are uh, able to benefit from um, hearing your talk live and, um, and also from the perspective of the uh, students and, and folks who will be able to uh, view and listen to the recording down the road. So thank you very much. And I know we wish you all the very best um, in your future research. Um, after this pandemic nonsense ends. <laughs> Thank you very much, all of you, uh, Heidi, Dan, and like uh, everybody and those who are participating. I, I appreciate your attendance. I know how challenging these days are, are and months are for everybody, but having you here, it's, it's a privilege, uh, really. I don't take it for granted and I appreciate your attention and engagement. And have Thank a Thank you great so day. much. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>